All right, good morning. Welcome to the Macro Show for Wednesday, August 28th, 2019. A lot going on, of course. Uh, great day for some freemium action here this morning. So welcome to all of our new viewers. Uh, I'm Christian Drake. I'm joined in the studio by Hedgeye CEO and Chief Iconoclast Keith McCullough. As a reminder, uh, just before we get going here, if you do have any questions, uh, pop them into the queue under the live stream there, uh, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the show. Keith. Thank you, Dr. Drake. Top three things in my notebook is what we do every morning, and again, we'll provide that in written form. We have a stat pack for you. Again, it's daily, it's data-driven, it's apolitical, it's not emotional, it's not based on tweets or Fed cuts, although we do predict proactively that the Fed was going to have to cut interest rates. Uh, point number one this morning is going to be the curve, uh, the, the yield curve that is. Number two is going to be the Russell, and number three is going to be the recession in Germany. First on the curve, this morning, in case you didn't know, now you're going to know, this is the worst it's been in curve terms. So again, if you take the 10-year and you subtract the two-year yield, you can see quite coherently here that this is the widest gap that we've seen between the two. That's called an inversion. Now, a lot of people have panic attacks when that first happened, and now they're on to the next macro tourist event of the day. Again, we don't do macro tourism. If you don't know what that is, that's jumping emotionally and frantically, again, from headline to headline. What we're doing God forbid, is going from time series to time series. Again, measuring and mapping the economic data, and the curve currently reflects that we're in what we call a quad four. That's when A, growth is slowing, and B, inflation is slowing at the same time in rate of change terms. The ROC, R-O-C, rate of change terms. If you have not studied calculus, you should. That is indeed the secret to the universe. And that is a very bearish thing for the bank stocks. We continue to be short of those and long of the things that are bond proxies that like that. And again, there's always something to be long somewhere along treasuries, utilities, REITs, and of course, gold, silver, and related items. Point number two this morning is the Russell. Now, if you're long the Russell and you haven't followed us or you're just trialing this or just getting it for free this morning, I'll give you a free tip. Don't do what CNBC has told you to do for the last year. Now, if you just bought stocks, you got to buy stocks. Yeah, just like, ah! <laughs> no wonder you have feelings. I would feel, I would feel a lot of bad things. I mean, really, uh, the Russell 2000, as of yesterday's close, uh, again, made a lower low versus the lows that it saw prior in May. Remember when people got body slammed in May or in Q4 of last year, for that matter, when this all started? Or even this month. I mean, the Russell basically made a lower low. Read. That's bad. Mathematically, euphemistically, or otherwise. Okay? So again, lower low versus, again, the prior lows. And now it's down 16.3% versus where you could have chased the chart when it looked fantastic. Charts look great, right? Now, just like all the guys who missed the gold move think the gold chart looks great, that's completely useless. Uh, so again, at the end of the day, you'd have to be up almost 18% to get back to break even. If you did that, we are short of the Russell in kind and small cap stocks, high beta stocks, all those things. And factor exposure speak are what you should be short in quad four. You're gonna hear a lot more about that. Point number three this morning, the DAX, Germany, quad four. Yep. Okay. So one point is that uh, for those of you that have been uh, you know, getting your, your, your head handed to you long, cheap European stocks. Remember, people were telling you to buy cheap European bank stocks back at the end of 2017 when we were actually still long of Europe. Then we just turned it. We make the turn. I go both ways, liberally educated and like it, my wife says. Oh, yes. That's what we did. We went bearish on Europe stocks at the end of 2017. Since then, look at this chart of the DAX. Okay. It's pretty broadly... Uh, uh, relevant uh, stock market. We told you to get out. Now, who tells you to get out? Most importantly, who tells you to get the you know what out in Canadian accent terms, all right? In Germany, all right? There you go. You got out. Yeah. Not one of our subscribers has been long Germany unless they're long German boons. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We liked them at 30 beeps. We liked them at zero beeps. We like them at minus 71 beeps on the tenure. Yeah. And then you get all these sophisticates that I went to school with. I had the lowest SAT score at Yale, so there are a lot of smart people there, of course. Uh, but uh, dumb old me just went and said, you buy German boons when you're going into the quad four, because a recession pays the bondholder in sovereign bond terms. Doesn't matter what the price is. God didn't call with a relative value model. No, 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 no. Called mucker. And you bought treasuries, you bought boons, and you bought all the things that look like that. And I hope you did too. Those are your top three things, all right? I know a lot of you struggle with that. Who, who on CNBC or otherwise, old wall, told you to ever buy Japanese government bonds? Who ever told you to buy the greatest security in the world, in the history of world securities? The thing only goes up and has no volatility. 
Oh, because it's expensive, zero interest rate policy. Eh, 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 eh. Again, if you have a view of slower for longer, or that the economy, God forbid, is slowing, quad four, and slowing faster with inflation falling, you buy the sovereign debt, okay? And it's made money across generations, all right? Uh, after we do the top three things, you know, a little bit less of a rant, and then I'll get into the wood, which is my notebook, okay? My notebook, I'm gonna start writing down the things that I already wrote down my notebook. Now this starts after the market closes in the prior day. Because you write down all closing prices, you write down the risk ranges, you call your analysts, your 40 people on your team, and you say, okay, is today a better day to improve our positioning, change our positioning, or not? Okay, it's all data dependent. That's all we do. Where is the range of the market's price? So again, in the S&P 500's terms, there's the top and the low end of the range. At the top end of the range, you sell. At the bottom end of the range, what do you do? You cover shorts and you buy, okay? We're not at the bottom end of the range today, so with futures down, I press them, okay? Even if, you, if you're not a presser, what you should have done is short them actually when they're up, closer to the top end of the range, we sent you a sell note on the Dow, bro, in point terms on Friday, all right? So S&P 500 every day, we'll give you the risk range, we'll give you uh, pretty much all the big things in macro, it's called the risk range product, okay? 28.20 is the low end of the range, so you have about 1.7% downside, about, just like getting out, about, yeah, international show we got going here. <coughs> what do you think about that? Uh, 2906, lower high versus the all-time closing high. All-time closing high is 3025. If you don't remember these numbers and if you don't write them down, you really aren't a pro, but you can get there, all right? It takes time. It's called deep and deliberate study, okay? So now 1.7% downside versus plus 1.3% on the ups. So again, today we should have more shorts coming into the open than we have longs. That's why in the Hedgeye Real-Time Alerts product, we have one long and seven shorts, which would include shorts, I might add, that are trading at either no times earnings, because they don't have earnings. Um, so again, if you look at something like work or something that's trading at 561 times next year's earnings, no worries, beyond the meat, okay? So again, we're short expensive stocks in a down market in quad four environment, and we like it, okay? Salesforce.com, another one, trades at 50 times earnings. What a deal, what a deal, again, Growth slowing, they're trying to acquire to, again, get people to believe, to still believe that Benioff isn't kind of walking away for no reason at all, all right? We get stocks, but we get stocks within the quads. We start with the quads, we go to the sector, then we go to the stocks, okay? And we can short stocks. We're the only firm out there, I think, that half the calls we make are short stocks. So we also get you out of those. Uh, again, uh, I digress. And then, so once we look at uh, the price and the range of the price, we're also looking and measuring and mapping what is the trend. We're using a three-factor model, price, volume, and volatility. We're also, again, showing you the measuring and mapping of it all. So if you look at volume yesterday, what did it do on the down day versus the prior day, which was an up day? Uh, the up day came on low volume or decelerating volume the prior day. Yesterday was a down day, right, Drake? Right. And uh, uh, stocks, uh, the volume was up 13% versus the prior day. So again, consistent with what's been happening on down days, volume accelerates with volatility being in a bullish trend. Now, if volatility is bullish, then the price of that thing is bearish. So again, on slide 22 in the current macro deck, you can see uh, when we deal in terms of talking about what is the market's trade trend and tail, intermediate term trend view or long term tail risk, we talk about a three factor model, not a simple, smooth, one factor, Moving monkey. No, 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 no. That's one factor. Let's do three. Let's get up to 2019. By 2020, we'll be at 20, uh, I don't know, I started doing this back in 2000, uh, 1999, 2000. I'm mean, we pretty soon I'm gonna sound like Kernan. I don't know, I don't know. He doesn't actually know. Uh, but what I know is that you need to evolve your process. If you're just looking at moving averages and you're using Yahoo Finance to call stock cheap on the multiple, you, you would qualify as an idiot, you know, a literal idiot. You wouldn't even last the first round of an interview here. So please, upgrade yourself, get better at this. Uh, again, we're not trying to criticize people, we're just trying to tell you not to do that because you can really hurt yourself and your family and your wealth by doing it the way that the old wall does. Okay, uh, what else we got? We look at the sectors. So what are the sector styles yesterday? Uh, within the sector styles, there are some certified train wrecks in growth space. Uh, cannabis stocks, for example, hit new lows, uh, down 3.6% was the MJ, which is the ETF for that. But if you look at the bongo board from yesterday, Josephine, you you can see, I call this a bongo board just because I make stuff up all the time, just names. Uh, but again, it's just it's what it is. It just kind of looked like a bongo board to me. But again, a lot of red out there. And look at the look at some of the green. The green that was more green was comms, XLC. In fact, it was up 1.1% when I shorted it in the PA uh, in the morning. The PA is called the personal count. And the way that we deal with it here, and some people are like, you don't have skin in the game. It's like, are you kidding me, jackass? I mean, what do you think I'm doing after I send out I, from compliance? sending out with my Canadian accent, what do you think I do? I have to send you the real-time alert, then I short it in my PA. 
My personal account, believe me, in the words of your favorite president, is not insignificant in terms of size. There's skin there. And by the way, every single real-time alert that I've done, which are in the, I don't know, how many thousands? Many, many thousands. Almost 5,000. 5,000 times I've had to look like either an idiot or not. Like, what kind of skin is that? And have my entire net wealth, family, and 80 people at this firm hostage to whether or not I'm right or wrong on any given day. Okay, so I think we got plenty of skin. All right, we got plenty of skin. Who else timestamps every position? Every mistake, every win, every loss. Suggest to somebody that they should do that. Um, oil and gas stocks got pounded yesterday, down 1.4%. Regional bank stocks, again, that looks like the curve. People say, well, how do you impute the view of the curve this morning to your portfolio positioning? Again, the market has it right. KRE, which is regional banks, we're down 1.8% this morning, and I digress. That's the roundup. By the way, it could have been long TLTs, which a lot of you are uh, putting, a, uh, I've heard of back tats and stuff. Don't do that, because eventually we're going to short the TLT, so you're going to have to get that tat taken off or put some other addendum to the TLT. We're not, we were bearish on TLT all the way up until the middle of 2016, and then flipped, again, we're bullish on it, and then flipped to, uh, to, to bearish from 20, middle of 2016 until uh, Q3 of 18. So again, we go with the cycle. Not a perma long TLT position or spies for that matter. Uh, it was up 1.5% yesterday. A lot of happy people. Of course, gold signaled immediate term trade overbought. And if you bought that before everybody liked the chart, you'd love that too. Uh, we don't buy it when the chart looks good to everybody. We're, we're trying to get ahead of that, right? Proactively predictable behavior. How's that for a little? Kind of a literal, a little, little bit of an alliteration. alliteration. Uh, in Asia, overnight. All right, I'll finish up here and then take your questions. Again, uh, this is what we do in the morning. We don't wake up and look at CNBC headlines or what Bloomberg's trying to trumpet as the anti-Trump view that they have. Again, it has nothing to do with any of that. We're trying to measure map the cycle in Asia. So what you saw last night uh, was that there was no fall through to the bounce in the Nikkei. It was barely up. Chinese stocks were down after the rebalance, down 0.3%. Uh, Hang Seng continued to crash, down 0.2%, which would take it down 20. 2.7% from where we went bearish in Q1 of 18. Again, write it all down before you make a comment. Just don't talk. Okay, what else? Uh, India. Look at India. And for those of you that are Indian or otherwise, uh, just uh, we got you out of India right at the top of that chart. We were long of India. Now we are out of India. And what I should be doing now is being short of India. Okay, so again, it was down a full 1% overnight. Uh, we have our geopolitical strategist, uh, Dan Christman, who would know better than most people that you watch on TV. He's a former soup at Westport, uh, Westport Point? West Point. Point, Port, I almost <laughs> gave him Westport. I'd love for him to be the soup in Westport, that's where I live. Uh, anyway, not billions. This is what Dan Crispin said, Kashmir, pay attention. Antagonizing acts here, this is rising, risk rising. Pakistan stock market's down in a pancake, obviously India is starting to melt down too, but it's all part of a bigger picture in global equities, which includes Germany, uh, the DAX as we already pointed out this morning, but the CAC 40 is also down, which is the French stock market, down about 5% in the last month alone. So again, there's actually not one stock market, not one. I'm not, there's no bias in this. If there was one, like if Singapore wasn't down 9% in the last month, I'd say maybe that's one of them, but it's not. There's not one major global equity market, you know, I can't even find a little one, that is bullish on my trend signal. Not one, okay? So that's, a, that's pretty bad. Uh, and it would coincide with global quad four data. Uh, guys, if you want to flag, flag that uh, to show people, I think it's slide 94 where we show where every country is currently and in which quadrant. Again, this is big time data. And again, if you don't have it, you need it. And if you're macro unaware, you need to become aware. If that, could, oh, that, that should probably, give people an aneurysm if they've never looked at numbers. But um, uh, in fact, I shouldn't have to talk. It's all about what the numbers are doing, not what I'm saying. Okay, uh, what else do I got going on for you? Risk range on oil, uh, not yet at the top end of the range, but indeed uh, interested in shorting that for the upteenth time since we started making the quad four call in September of last year. Again, top end of the risk range for WTI is 56.77. Again, look at your pin sheet. Every day we have risk ranges for natural gas, WTI, gold, et cetera. Top end of the range for gold is 15.55 and you buy more at 1491. Again, risk manage around the core of your position. Don't take half your capital and just go all in or out. That would just, you, we could put you at New York, New York and Vegas and do that, but this is not what we're doing. We're trying to help you uh, risk manage your net wealth across asset allocations and what we call full cycle investing. Okay, 10 uh, year yield low into the risk range, 145 to 162. Uh, if we go back to where I was, 10 year yield, just same thing. Every, everything's got a range, right? 145 to 162. So at 162, you'd buy bonds, and at 145, you'd sell bonds, okay? So as we approach 145, and people are begging for more cowbell, and we go into month end, I'd raise some cash, because when you put the cash in the account at the end of the month, if you have a bank account that pays something on those savings, you get the coupon, 
again on the cash. So again, don't get, don't get uh, uh, I guess, just don't get complacent about being long bonds. Buy some at the lower range, sell some at the top end of the range, use our daily risk range product to help you do that. Uh, we even have Bitcoin in there, by the way, which we've been bullish on since April of this year. And I think that's it other than um, Autodesk, which is gonna get a lot of chit chat today because I wrote my early look note about it. Again, I'll take the whole process and then I'll go from macro to micro and I'll say, I'll be damned. I'll be damned. Autodesk surprised the old wall and all of its followers last night. Because the Autodesk reported a great quarter, guys. But then they guided down Q3. I wonder why. CapEx, which all of our subscribers know, is now negative on a year-over-year -year basis. Negative, OK? Uh, this is an IT spending company that was a recipient of this thing called tax reform. All right, this is when we were bullish on all that stuff. Now they're guiding down because CapEx is negative. I'll be damned. Stock's down 25% versus where you could have chased the chart uh, back in, I think it was back in May, uh, or at least early April. See that one? Or, well, yeah, it was early April. And then again in July, you could have chased it a lower high at 174. But do you really want to be that guy? You're down 25% from where you could have chased the chart. 25. And people are still talking about, oh, but I don't have a view on a recession. That's a recession in your portfolio. That one right there, okay? Down 25% if you chase the chart there. Don't do that. CapEx is a major risk. Be on the other side of the CapEx cycle. The comparisons only get more difficult as we go throughout the fourth quarter for that one in particular. Uh, and if you want to ask about anything else related or otherwise, I uh, have lots of time here for some questions. All right. That was too Let's long. Start it off. 16 minutes. Too much teaching. That was good. A lot but, going on there. Yeah. Well, the, our, our power users are like, come on, get on with it, man. We know what the risk ranges are. Um, all right, a few uh, or a number of, I guess, process redux questions here with, with some new viewers on. Um, so looking at the macro deck um, in your GDP predictions, you have both the year over year and the two year uh, base, base effects, the two year comps. Um, can you explain how, how, you know, what's the calculus inside of that and how do you, how do you, you know, how does that, how do you use that to predict the, um, um, the out quarters. How do we I'm use trying to the consolidate base a number yeah, of Yeah, there's a lot of here. questions. Yeah. I mean, so again, we use the two-year base effect. It's a mathematical matter. You take the last two years of growth. Again, you add up every single year, and you divide by two, because you're taking two years. You, you have a base effect. Now, that base effect, what happens is that almost 80% of the time, the inverse ends up being the future. So if something went up, the probability is rising that it goes down. Right? If something goes down, the probability rises that it goes up. Okay? We've proven this, just back testing it. Some people say to us, in the early years, we had a couple of big institutional clients, which are much bigger ones now. Hey, uh, do you have a white paper on this? I'm like, I'm not going to go back to school to write a white paper on this. You either believe it or you don't believe it. And this is what, essentially, one of the core beliefs that we have, which is embedded across all of economic and macro market history. Uh, and it's just that. So again, we have a central tendency to believe uh, that, again, that things are going to mean revert. And then what we do is we take each incremental data point, so you guys can see on, um, uh, I think on slide 14 uh, currently of the macro deck, you can see that what we have is a daily now cast. So we have 30 data points per month that are dropped into a predictive tracking algorithm that give us a now cast of where GDP is. If you go back, actually go back one uh, to slide 13, currently we're at 2.1-ish uh, on year over year GDP, which is down a lot from the peak of the cycle, which you can go back to Q2 and Q3 of last year, which you had uh, threes. Our model predicted the upside, everything that we're long today, is things that we were short then, okay? So again, the model is objective. When growth is accelerating, we're gonna be long different things than when growth is decelerating. When both growth and inflation are decelerating at the same time, go to slide uh, 15, I think it is. 15, uh, so our now cast for headline inflation. We bought uh, treasuries when the headline inflation peaked in the third quarter of last year, and that's what you do. I mean, if you get the real rate uh, right in terms of um, real yields, you also get gold really right. So again, that's the whole point, is that we're constantly measuring and mapping using data. I think a lot of people that uh, just don't like me, which will be many for many, many, many hugely years to come, uh, have wanted me to be somebody that I'm not for years. Um, what we are is we're data dependent. I might color it up, I may be as faulted as any other human being, but what we're really trying to do is get you into what quadrant and asset allocation that the economy is actually ticking at. There is no conjecture. There's no guessing. Okay, this is all about the data, and again, it will set you free. All right, a lot of questions on gold, and I think you just partially answered that. So they're asking about fundamentals versus um, what you do in, in the different quads. Um, and I think in the, the pretext to, to one of these questions, I think, answers it. So if you have, if you have dollar down, you have growth slowing, and you have real yields falling, 
That's the that's all time high for gold. That's your factor for gold. All time high in gold in 2011 had all those things. Currently, we're missing one of those things, which is a down dollar. Now, what gold likes the most out of all those things, because again, one thing that's consistent with having uh, real yields falling is real inflation expectations falling. And again, having, you know, that's the number one thing is that growth is slowing and real inflation expectations are falling. So on a real yield basis, Gold loves that more than anything else. Now, if you also get the Fed to debotch and devalue the dollar like Bernanke did to a 40-year low in, in 2011, now you get the all-time high in the, in, in the dollar, or all-time high in gold and a 40-year low, rather, in the U.S. dollar. Um, so again, we're just at the beginning of that part of the movie. So if you're sitting there saying, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I missed it, I missed it, I missed it. Well, one, you did, uh, so you should have subscribed. And two, or you should have known that real yields dominate gold uh, outright. And again, we didn't go bullish on gold if you go back to the chart, uh, Josephine, on gold until I highlight this green box here in the fourth quarter of 2018. So again, we've had one hell of a run. And again, it's not about just getting started. It's about whether or not the prevailing conditions, again, prevailing quad conditions of growth and inflation support being long gold or not. There's no magical valuation. There's no super duper thing relative to Bitcoin. No. It's whether or not growth and inflation continue to slow. And again, uh, the markets price that in quite conveniently and, and right on time, I might add. All right. Um, thoughts on uh, healthcare lagging in quad four? Well, there are so. parts of healthcare that have regulatory issues. So every, again, when you use a four quadrant playbook, which is on slide eight, um, again, we have things that go up and go down in each quadrant. Okay, so there are four quads. You can read up on that if you'd like. Um, but again, that doesn't mean that it's bulletproof like uh, Tiffany's blue box used to be you know, in the 80s. Uh, you just deliver that to anybody and you're going to make them happy. Um, or most people, if it's certainly if it had something of value in it. Uh, but this is a framework. Okay, it's a process. If, if you then tell me, well, we're going to re regulate all of these parts of healthcare, well, you may not want to go buy those parts of healthcare. So I think that there's that part of it. Um, there's certainly uh, earnings risks that has been revealed across a, a, a large swath of companies. And you've also seen pricing be a big risk to, to a lot of these companies. So uh, in, in other words, deflation in their own P&L. Um, so it hasn't been one of my favorites. Again, what I also do is I, I don't just take the quads. That would be silly, right? First of all, you have to come up with that. Uh, second of all, you have to measure map that daily. But then I, that's that's the A part of the test, then the B test, if you're into A-B testing, for those of you that are objective scientific testers of things, then I take the B test and I say, what is the trade trend tail signal? Does it say buy me or not? And that's essentially why I picked REITs and utilities over something like healthcare, because the trade trend tail signal was much stronger and more obvious in those things. So that's why uh, all of our subscribers are along those things and not long healthcare. All right. Um Question on those risk ranges. Uh, I sold part of my bond exposure as we approach the, the low end of the range um, on, on yields. I do have some bond FOMO now. Um, what, what do we got do? some FOMO? Got some FOMO. What do we do now? Wait, wait for a correction to the. Well, anytime the you, end anytime of the you uh, don't have a max position when something's hitting new highs, you're going <laughs> to have a little FOMO, right? Yeah, the little fear that you're not perfect. We have one person actually that we've highlighted that CNBC used to like, uh, him and Tangelo, like they promote all these people. They got this clown right now, a Canadian guy, I feel bad for our country, uh, my country, my home country, my green card guy, um, you know, this O'Leary guy. Uh, but I mean, you get, this is, you gotta, he wears orange, Josephine, you could show. He's perfect. Now, if you have FOMO and you wanna be perfect, I mean, he, he, he's just a guy, uh, he's had a lot of issues lately, and this is kind of the thing that you don't, you don't really wanna, uh, you know, actually, we're, we're gonna hide him today. The, the, the producer's saying we don't wanna show him. His name's Bernie Madoff, all right, he never was wrong, ever. So FOMO's a, a real thing that you're gonna feel, you're not gonna be perfect. So here's one, one way to think about it, all right? So I've talked about asset allocation many, many times to power users of the process, and again, think of, you, you, de you determine, this is a, you know, at least for now, it's still uh, free, free market capitalism in America. You can decide your own asset allocation, okay? So if we take uh, you know, what's actually going on in terms of how I think about uh, risk, and I say, okay, I've already defined, and you need to define it on your own. Okay, so I have my asset allocation at Keith McCullough, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, you want to call my wife, she might not give you details on it. Uh, but again, I got my asset allocation model, my asset allocation model. I've already determined that my max position by asset class, I already know what that is, okay? So let's just start with some of the big stuff, equities. Uh, oh, actually, I should, I, should, I should change that. I should, I, should, I should be more empathetic to all of you that have never heard about being long treasuries or currencies or, uh, God forbid, the right commodity that really isn't a commodity like gold, which is a currency. Let's just cross that up. 
Let's talk about stocks. All right, let's talk about stocks. Stocks. All right, we got stocks. We got, uh, let's go back to the black here. Uh, we got uh, CRB, commodities, uh, even options. We can have options in there as an asset allocation. What percentage of your capital are you willing to put in each one? What is the max? Okay, so I, these are really easy answers for me. I've already answered these. Four and two. All right, so there you go. So fixed income, if I have TLT, my max position is 10%. But I also have EDV at 10%. And then I have zeros at 10%. Yeah? And then I have, uh, we have munis at, uh, at, at 10%. So you just like, you can get to massive positions. We, like, my, my personal account, like it's, people are like, how could you say that? My performance isn't like that. Like personal accounts at all time highs? No shit, Sherlock. I mean, we're basically long all that stuff in gold. And, and, and in here, we have 6% max positions when they're at their max in utilities and REITs and housing. So again, there's, you can, we have a fully asset allocated model here. Now where you get the FOMO, well, why don't you decide what percentage of that you want to sell at the top end of the range? You want to sell a fifth of it, a third of it, half of it? Half of it's a little aggressive, all right? Now, if you don't have to pay any fees like I don't have to at Fidelity in, in terms of risk managing treasuries, why don't you trade it like 10 times a week? It doesn't matter, it doesn't cost you anything. So all those people that have told you all the years, oh, you're churning the account. Go to your reform broker with that bullshit. Now again, decide what it is gonna be. You will have far less FOMO if you're doing things on a rules-based basis within the framework that is also rules-based. Have discipline. The hardest part about this is A, knowing what the hell you're doing and B, having a process. But then the real game starts. Do you have discipline? Do you have FOMO? Do you have emotion? What do you do when you make decisions? How do you touch your portfolio? Is it the same way all the time? Is it consistent or is it all over the place? You got it. Right. Um, from a process perspective, is it true that you predict the G and the I with data and only then you predict the P? Do you predict the P based on historic actions from the Yeah, uh, now that I've doodled all over the place, sorry for doing that to you guys. GIP, that's the growth inflation policy model. Growth inflation policy. So these two things lead to this, all right? So the growth slows and the inflation slows and Powell gets poopy poopy in the Powell pants. Got that? Goes dovish. So again, growth and inflation front run or proactively predict policy, Federal Reserve behavior, Trump behavior. Trump's in a panic, unhinged. Does that have anything to do with my model? No, but I could observe that he's tweeting a lot more frequently and a little bit more radically. Uh, but again, that's what politicians do when the growth and the inflation is slow. You got that? Uh, they panic. So uh, you can substitute the policy for panic, or you could say, okay, uh, the P could be something else, like, oh, growth and inflation are accelerating, which our model also predicted that interest rates were gonna break out to the upside in 2013, and again in 2017, throughout parts of 2018. Because again, when growth and, uh, growth and inflation are accelerating, we call that slide six, quad two. In quad two, you short bonds, you, uh, you short treasury bonds, you buy bank stocks, you short REITs, you buy growth. Again, so again, this is, this, is, this is what we're essentially trying to do, is front run the behavior of the Federal Reserve so that you don't have to wake up at eight o'clock in the morning if that's what you're doing on vacation, because that's ne never when you'd wake up if you're doing this for real. Uh, every day I get up, God willing, two feet on the floor at 4.36 a.m. If you want to check me on Twitter, you can find that. If I'm on vacay, I might sleep in a little bit. But the reality is that you know, if, if you're not that person, you need to outsource uh, to, to, to a real entity, an independent research provider that can give you the update, then this is what you need to know. You don't need to know what Tom, Dick, and Harry are promoting on CNBC. That's ridiculous. Understand that somebody is the monkey in that situation, and it's probably you. So again, don't do that. Follow the data. It will set you free. I guess we'd also just note that to some extent, um, it is a two-way communication loop. So you have the growth and inflation drive the policy response, and I guess you know, the, the more recent case study is a, is a good case study in this. So if you have pervasive quad four, you get growth and inflation slowing, you get the policy response to that, um, but the policy response is good at driving asset reflation and commodity reflation. So you get the price effects. So you're in quad four, you get a large scale policy response to that. There's a tendency to push you into quad three yep. and you get stagflationary conditions because you can't print real growth you can print price inflation so if you get a big policy response you get the price effects you don't get the growth effects and you have a tendency to roll over into quad exactly three. guys show slide six quickly and we'll take the next question well actually no there it is there it is indeed whenever uh you see you could see bernanke you can see janet you can see poopy poopy in the pe pal <laughs> pants it all happens in here when the data's there, they need to get that the hell out of there and go there. 
How do you get reflation or economic stagflation, which is really an unfortunate thing for them, because of course, politically, they would never admit being guilty on this front. We have inequality, you know that, right? Because all of us people with money, the average power user, of uh, the average user at Hedgeye has a, a, base, salary, a, a, a base salary of north of $400,000. So we're not talking to the poor bastards who've actually had to suck it up. When you reflate the asset prices, we know what to do, right? We know what to do. We buy real estate, we buy REITs, we buy gold. Again, when you, re when you reflate the asset prices, those other people have to pay the bill, okay? So again, not a political comment, that's a fact. If they were to actually get this and or this, which is quad one and two, which is pro-growth, this is real growth. If you go back to, uh, that should not be, I, I apologize. Of all the mistakes I've made this morning, speaking, my weight, this should be green, all right? This should be green, come on, mucker. What the, that's with an M. Um, look at that. This is the Mecca, quad one. Not Q1, quad one. That's when real growth is accelerating. Real growth. That's 1983 to 1989. That's 1993 to 99. So if you're a you know, bloody Democrat that just wakes up in the morning just feeling that politic, or if you're a Republican, you can love me both. Huh? Maybe this could be the goddamn Joel Osteen show <laughs> with the goddamn in front of it. Some people get upset about that. I love my God, I didn't mean to use his name in vain. This quad one is for the people. That's where the people get paid. That's where everybody likes all the politicians. We've not had extensive quad one since the financial crisis. Okay, so again, that's where you'd have oil. Oil, by the way, in both periods, how'd you have that? 1983 to 89, oil average below 20. Did you not know that? If you don't know these things, you should not be investing in macro. All right, a uh, question from a power user. Um, has both the daily risk range and the ETF Pro Plus product uh, both have, um, I guess, ostensibly entry and exit prices or, or price ranges. Um, does one trump the other in terms of um, defining the entry or exit point if they are diff if they differ from each other? I guess the update, the frequency of the update is a little bit different. So yeah, well, we do that every. I provide that one ETF Pro every weekend, so I go through it myself. I hand bomb it, and I I want to do it. I don't do it because you know one could argue after 11 years of this firm, I should get somebody else to do it. But if I don't write it down and do it for you. I don't deliberately study it and understand it. So again, every week you get that across all ETFs that we like on the long and the short side. And at the top end of the range you sell, and at the bottom end of the range you buy. It's not that complicated, really. Having the discipline to do it and having the ability to scale in and out of it, because you're not going to nail every top end. And by the way, some things the top end of the range never come. Uh, or eventually, when you think they're never going to come, then they come quickly. So again, you have to do this over time. Running money, your own money, certainly. And then if you can, I, I actually recommend that a lot of people run their own money before they start to say, which a lot of people on Wall Street run other people's money, and they, you know, they don't feel it quite the same way. It's a different feeling when you could lose all your money. Now, if you could lose other people's money and blame everybody else and then just keep your job, isn't that great? I mean, that's, to some extent, that's been the history of Wall Street. All right. Um... Let's see, currencies. Uh, thoughts on the Norwegian krona? Um, noticed it's weak uh, versus the euro, even though central bank is more hawkish than the ECB. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go to Norway this morning. Yeah, if you want to call Kramer, I'm sure he'll say something about anything, but I, ju I just not focused on it. Yeah. Um, well, it looks, get, it looks it, just like the Aussie uh, dollar, and it's also a, a derivative impact of slowing in, in China. Yeah. And I get in his comment is also probably the point. Um, it's weak versus the euro because they're going to have to catch down to the hawkishness mm -hmm. or to, to the dovishness out of the ECB. Yep. Um, so you're going to have some, some measure of a policy reconvergence, um, or at least that's what the, the market is expecting. Yeah. The, the main uh, the thing with Norway, like slide 94, if you guys look at it, my main focus is the top 20 countries by GDP. Of course, we do more than that. Uh, Norway is not one of those countries. Um, but again, if you're an institutional client, I'd be happy to talk to you about Norway for an hour, send you all of our models. Because uh, again, it's the same methodology no matter what uh, country you're in. If you want to look at slide 98, you can see that we blow that out to uh, EM countries, which also does not include Norway. Um, so it's, it's one of those countries that I just don't spend any time on. That doesn't mean that I can't come up with our method, the, the, the methodological answer to the question, um, but I hope you can appreciate uh, why I don't have the answer, and moreover, why the answer is I don't know. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, something on the pound, by the way. Uh, to use something uh, as an example, how to use the process. Go back to slide 94. Find the country, in this case, 
the UK, as opposed to chasing the headline, well, I'll be short of the pound based on Boris this morning. I mean, jeez, I mean, jeez, Louise. I mean, this is getting painful. We've been bearish on the pound, by the way, if Josephine flashed that back, I tweeted it this morning, uh, middle of 2018 against the dollar, okay? So you can see the chart. I mean, you don't have to get Boris right this morning to have had the pound right. Um, but to get the pound right, you gotta get the quads right. So go, get, go back to slide 94, all right? Here's the way to use the process. Now, I go, you, you asked me about a country. In this case, it's gonna be the United Kingdom. Okay, and we're gonna make that red because this is not a good situation for the UK. I don't have a political opinion on Boris. I think I kind of like his hair. I mean, okay, that's a completely useless comment. In as much as 99% of what I'd hear on Bloomberg, CNBC, or Fox today about the UK, earmuffs. What I care about in the UK is okay, we're in Q3. Oh, look at all this. Uh, the world's kind of in quad four and because the mean and the mode of the world is in quad four, and you're slowing towards the cannonball moment, which we call the black hole. Um, but again, the UK, eh, four, that sucks. Um, so I, so you're, you're into the finishing move part here of the UK, of the pound going down against the dollar. And conversely, the dollar has a central tendency to rise in quad four because people are pulling their money out of other speculative currencies. So again, that back tests as well. We don't have a lot of time to go through all that. But again, in the words of your favorite president, believe me, did you guys just miss the camera there? Are we amateurs? They don't know what they're doing. All right. Um, we any thoughts on silver? A bunch of silver questions in the queue. Silver? Yeah. We're not going to talk. I mean, silver is the same answer. <laughs> silver right now, people are broadening out their precious metal bets. You can broaden that PLTM to platinum too. Yep. Um, so again, it's just the same, same thing. And the only time I'm not long silver is when the trade trend tail signals does not confirm it. Um, so again, we're bullish on silver. We've issued plenty of uh, buy signals on silver this year. When it's down, not now that you're chasing it, when it's up. I know you're a chaser. FOMO is a big chasing thing, right? FOMO, you chase high and you freak out low. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, maybe you should get the Nigerian brothers to help you with that. All right, um, can you comment on which COT data you use? So um, they're talking about the commitment of traders reports, that's your uh, yep. CFTC data. Uh, we use the non-commercial uh, series, so that get, that's your, uh, your proxy for, for speculative positioning, not people hedging for actual business purposes or the like. Yeah, maybe um, we'll take one more question here. Something, right. Give me something good. Give me something good. Uh, Keith, what do you think about the trade war? You notice that I don't give a damn about the trade war? <laughs> we haven't made one call in three years based on the trade war. So now that I've asked myself the last question, this has not been about the trade war. Do you know what happens when growth slows? You have political problems, you have trade wars, you have a lot of bad stuff that starts to happen because when growth slows, the political edifice is under pressure. So the causal factor all along, all along, China started slowing in Q1 of 2018. It's almost Q4 of 2019, okay? So again, now that the US and China are slowing at the same time, they're both in a war or whatever. It doesn't change the methodology. The causal factor that got all these issues in motion was actually growth and inflation slowing. So I really didn't have to be the expert that everybody purports themselves to be on every geopolitical matter. Again, isn't that great that you can wake up in the morning saying, I don't know. I don't know about Kashmir, but I do know that India is breaking down. Oh, then I'll look at the quads in India. Then I'll look at the quads in Pakistan. Oh, okay, now I know why I should not be long India. Okay, so just try to try to open your mind. If, if this is, I know this for a lot of you, this is new. I know we do it differently. I think that's a good thing. I think it's a really good thing. I don't think anybody would accuse Wall Street of nailing it at every economic cycle turn for the last 20 years. And that's precisely why I built this place. I was just sick and tired of watching people get obliterated by people that are completely full of shit on TV. So again, or pushing their own way to get compensated, which is worse. So again, and that's what we want you to do is engage, learn, empower yourself to, again, do this on your own. This is a teaching tool. It's largely awareness. It's where is the data? Let's start with that as opposed to political opinions, valuation opinions, and conjecture or otherwise. All right. I think that's a good message to end it on. Cool. Um, thanks, Keith. Thanks, everyone, for joining in. I'll see you back here tomorrow morning, same time.